I'm Judd Myers. I'm Scott Tipton. Welcome to Blast Off. Welcome, everybody, to another Blast Off podcast. This is our home show where we'll be giving you some insight and stories from Comics 101 and retails. The professor is in today, and I would like to ask, what wisdom are you going to impart upon us, professor? This week's 101, we'll be heading back to the Okie Fidoki Swamp with a look at Walt Kelly's comic strip Pogo with It Ain't No How Permanent. And what's going on for retails? Well, I'm going to talk about the feelings of Pogo and just... All of the things that happened to him while he was shopping inside of a comic book store. <laughs> no, this week I'm going to be talking about the very intimate nature of comic book subscription programs. And we'll discover why breaking up is sometimes very hard to do. It's not you. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Nobody's heard that before. Let's get going. I'm Scott Tipton, and this is Comics 101. This week, we'll be hanging up the capes and tights for a while, and taking a look at a body of work that was profoundly influential on both comic books and comic strips, and was a large part of American culture for decades, but is somehow all but unknown among the general public today. Ask a guy off the street to name the great comic strips. He'll probably name Schultz's Peanuts... Maybe Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes if he's got a good memory. But what he probably won't mention is one of the best strips ever to appear in newspapers, Walt Kelly's Pogo. Pogo ran for nearly 25 years, combining genuine sentiment and emotion with wicked political satire, expressed with poetic grace by one of the most unique wordsmiths to work in comics, and rendered with a beauty and delicacy still unmatched to this day. Pogo was at times hilarious, charming, heartbreaking, and poignant. Walt Kelly began his career working for Walt Disney in the 1930s as a storyman and animator on projects like Pinocchio, Dumbo, and Fantasia. In 1941, Kelly left Disney to focus on comic books, primarily for Dell on Animal Comics, Fairy Tale Parade, and Mother Goose, as well as a variety of Dell's Disney comics. It was in the pages of Animal Comics that his trademark characters Pogo Possum and Albert Alligator first appeared in print. Pogo and Albert would appear regularly in Animal Comics for the next seven years. However, it wasn't until 1948, when the comic strip Pogo first appeared in the New York Star, that the characters truly took the focus in Kelly's work that they would enjoy throughout the next three decades. Pogo with a comic strip is all about Pogo with a possum, a good-hearted sort who lives in the Okefenokee Swamp, just looking to enjoy the sunset and maybe go fishing and take a swim. However, Pogo's friends, the other denizens of the Okefenokee, are usually in the midst of schemes and scandals that wind up keeping Pogo from his precious peace and quiet. Chief amongst the stirs of a treble is Pogo's best friend Albert Alligator, a know-it-all layabout who tends to wind up eating Pogo's food and hogging Pogo's bed. Pogo's other close friend is Porcupine, a perpetually depressed porcupine and the swamp's onlyest orphan, who has little good to say about most folks, including himself and an unerring ability to see through all the hoopla and craziness that overtakes everyone from time to time. Porky is tremendously faithful to his friend, Pogo, as much as Albert, if not more so, and what few meager displays of emotion Porcupine makes tend to be headed in Pogo's direction. Another of Pogo's friends is Churchy La Femme, a somewhat excitable turtle wearing a jaunty pirate hat. Churchy can more easily be swept up into things than Albert or Porky, and tends to be easily swayed by his stomach. Howland Owl is the self-declared intellectual of the swamp, and more often than not, it's his schemes that wind up raising the fuss, such as his regular clockwork attempts to get Pogo to run for president, sometimes entirely without Pogo's knowledge or even his presence. Finally, the primary feminine influence in the swamp is Mademoiselle Hepzibah, a good-hearted French skunk who often finds herself recruited as would-be first lady for Pogo's unwitting and unwilling presidential campaigns. Porky, meanwhile, has the mother of all unrequired crushers on Hepzibah, and can never bring himself to confess. There were dozens of other supporting characters as well, like Borgard the Hound Dog, Ms. Beaver, Deacon Mushrat, Bunrab, and so many others. 
including a personal favorite of mine, P.T. Bridgeport, a carnival barker bear whose word balloons looked like old-style circus leaflets. But Pogo, Albert, Porky, and his friends tended to be the core of the strip. Kelly's storylines were lengthy, often running four, five, and six weeks at a time. Common enough newspaper strip pacing for drama or adventure strips, but practically unheard of for comedy strips. Breaking up the longer storylines was usually slower paced, thoughtful moments, such as Pogo and company on a boat or sloop, absentmindedly ruminating over life in general. Walt Kelly was also among the first in the mass media to champion environmental causes and attempt to bring the issue of pollution to the public with one of his most cool lines of dialogue as a concerned Pogo looks out onto a polluted swamp. We have met the enemy and he is us. As Pogo's popularity grew, Kelly grew more confident and began injecting more political commentary and satire into the strip. Probably the most famous of these storylines involved simple Jay Malarkey, the Okefenokee's analog to red-baiting U.S. Senator Joe McCarthy, and his villainous association with the swamp's resident ne'er-do-wells, Deacon Mushrat, Mole McCrony, and Sarcophagus Macabre. In later years, J. Edgar Hoover, Spiro Agnew, Nikita Khrushchev, Fidel Castro, and Richard Nixon were targets for Kelly's satire. Walt Kelly was a satirist, sure, but he was also a businessman first. Knowing that some newspapers would refuse to run the more politically oriented strips, Kelly would prefer substitute strips for those editors usually involving a cast of white fluffy bunnies, carrying out various cute fluffy bunny type behavior. When you think about it, this was a brilliant move on Kelly's part. Not only did this guarantee that he wouldn't temporarily lose placement in the accompanying syndicate dollars in any papers, but it also served as a tip-off to attentive readers that, when the white bunnies showed up, maybe there was something going on in the strip that their local newspaper was refusing to run, and so maybe they should seek out a competing paper. But as wicked as Kelly's satirical tongue could be, Pogo was just as much the home of some of the most delightful and whimsical wordplay and poetry since the works of Lewis Carroll. Pogo and his friends spoke in a unique mix of Southern and Black dialect and Elizabethan English, and their debates about verse, poetry, and song are some of the high points of the strip. A holiday tradition in the Okefenokee was the singing of Christmas carols, each year is more ludicrous and inaccurate than the last. Over time, a certain carol became a standard, as Howland and Churchy's version of Deck the Halls morphed into Deck Us All with Boston Charlie. Deck us all with Boston Charlie, Walla Walla Wash and Kalamazoo. Go to squeezing on the trolley, Swallow Dollar Cauliflower Alley got room. Don't we know our And while Kelly's wit and wordplay were a large part of the strip's success, it was his gorgeous artwork that held everything together. The appealing designs of Pogo and company were cute and pleasant without being grating or saccharine. And as for the backgrounds, well, nobody could draw a tree like Walt Kelly. Nobody. Pogo was one of the first comic strips to find serious mainstream success in the bookstores. Dozens and dozens of reprint books were published, often going into fourth and fifth printings. While Pogo was a smash in the publishing world, Kelly was very selective about allowing the use of his characters in any other merchandising. There were a few cups and novelties, but not many. When Kelly agreed to allow Procter & Gamble to manufacture Pogo figurines as a purchase incentive with boxes of detergent, the artist rejected prototype after prototype as not being true enough to his characters, until finally the exasperated artist, who was not a sculptor by the way, reached for the clay and sculpted the statues himself. The resulting Procter & Gamble figurines are quite rare today and much in demand among Pogo collectors. Even harder to find are the two cinematic translations of Walt Kelly's work. The best treatment comes from the 1969 network television special, The Pogo Special Birthday Special, directed by the legendary animator Chuck Jones and produced by Jones & Kelly. The special details Pogo and Friends' attempts to put together a surprise birthday party for Porcupine, who doesn't really have a birthday since he's a Norphin. The special boasts music written by Kelly and his longtime musical collaborator Norman Monrath, 
and surprisingly fun voice acting from Walt Kelly and Chuck Jones themselves. Walt Kelly plays Albert Howland and P.T. Bridgeport, while Jones, in his only voiceover work ever to my knowledge, voices Porky, Bunrab, and Basil the Butterfly, while animation veteran June Foray plays Pogo. The special manages to capture the sentimental side of Kelly's work, but doesn't translate much of the strip's biting wit, perhaps due to the influence of Jones, whose post Looney Tunes work was often overly cloying. Still, the opening minutes of the special, with Churchy floating along the swamp on a raft, singing and playing the banjo, capture as much of the quality of Walt Kelly's work as any film work could hope to. Oh, the king and the queen were twirling at coits in the meadow behind on the mere. Though mainly the meadow was middled with mold and heretical hitherto here. The prince and the princess were plating the plate and parading quite primly the pier. And that's why the duchess stuck ducks on the duke, for, for no one was over to see her. Now violin only with pizzicato, plinky plinky plunkety plank. Plunky plunky plink 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 zoom zoom and e zoom. Squeakity squeaky squeak squeaky squeak. Come sordino squeaky squeak. Now sense a sordino squeak 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 squeak. Now pizzicato. Plunk, plunk, plunk. The special was briefly available on videotape in the early 80s, but is now long out of print and nearly impossible to find. Although, like most things nowadays, you can find it on the YouTubes. The second attempt to bring Pogo to the screen was somewhat less successful. Pogo for President, also released under the title I Go Pogo, was one of the first, if not the first, full-length clay animation feature films. Unfortunately, it doesn't have much else to recommend it. Directed by Mark Paul Chinoy, the 1980 film is faithful to the works and writings of Kelly, but has none of the sparkling wit or emotion of the original strips. Not Helping Matters is a voice cast full of B-level 1970s celebrities, such as Ruth Buzzy, Jimmy Breslin, and Jonathan Winters, which does no favors to the somewhat lifeless animation. Only Vincent Price's performance as Deacon Muskrat does justice to Kelly's inspiration and characterization. Nobody meant to make a mess of it all. It just seemed to work out that way. Everyone was so busy trying to trick everyone else that they all ended up tricking themselves. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the Okefenokee Swamp, where life is kind of peaceful. But you see, there are times when it is madness, election madness, with every fool and his frog wanting Pogo Possum for president. Everyone, that is, except Pogo himself. All he wants is to go fishing with his friend Porky Pine. Like that morning when the two of them were sitting down by the sycamore tree and Porky was about to finish the very worst joke in the whole swamp. Oh, oh, I, uh, I forgot what the most say is. Pogo for President also saw a brief video release and is just about as difficult to locate these days and is also available on YouTube. Walt Kelly died in October 1973. His widow Selby, a talented artist in her own right, with the help of Kelly's longtime assistant Henry Shikuma and a few others, continued to produce Pogo for the strips until 1975, completing Kelly's contract with the syndicate. The only reference within the strip itself to the loss of Kelly came on Christmas Day 1973, with a strip that shows Pogo and friends in their ever-present boat now bearing the initials WK on the side. Porky remarks that it's the kind of Christmas he feels more quiet and thoughtful than jumping and singing. Pogo agrees, noting, We lost so much this year. Miss Beaver replies that we didn't lose so much. We just gave it back after borrowing it for a while. Echoing words first written by Walt Kelly in a strip 25 years earlier, she adds, He always said don't take life too serious. It ain't no how permanent. No, it ain't, Mrs. Beaver. No, it ain't.
You know what I hear the most about from people who walk in the store from the first time? Hmm. They come in and they look at the two little chairs and the two little table in the front of the store. <laughs> and they go, what's that for? Well, it's our kids section. Your kids have to be able to sit down when they read. And the look on their faces, that's like, oh, do you guys have a kids section? Of course we have a kids section. We're a comic book store. <laughs> well, it's not just any kids section. No. Uh, one of the things that you find in our store is that every piece of furniture and every shelf is designed by us and built by hand and stained and cherry wood and everything. So we wanted to make the kids section the same thing, the same quality. And it started with the chairs. Those two chairs, I had passed by a, an antique store here in California. And what they did was they built recreations of Spanish royalty, their bedrooms and their dining rooms, huge thrones and all kinds of, you know, extraordinary pieces just that were, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And there was a throne that was in the window, extraordinary throne. And I went in and I said, uh, this is amazing. Um, can you make me a really little mini one? <laughs> And the guy was like, uh, how many are you talking about? I was like, like, not for a dollhouse, but like, like for a s small person, like for a little king. Like, <laughs> a kinglet. Like, yeah, a kinglet and a queenlet. And, and he said, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't see why not. And while it was very expensive, he uh, made these chairs and they were extraordinary. And I said, can you take the arms off? And he said, well, why? It's, this is part of the design of this throne. And I said, well, because some kinglets are big kinglets and some big kinglets are small kinglets and some queenlets are big. You have to be able to, you know, really fit on it and it has to be super strong. So the kids come in and they don't really know that they're, you know, sitting on these extraordinarily unique pieces of furniture that have rounded Peruvian coins that are attached to it. They just know they, they feel like a king. And they feel like a queen. Going along with that, I thought it was important when I first saw our layout that we have those chairs and we have that table. And then just the side are shelves to that same size. Mm. I love going into a room and I see bookshelves that are at my height. <laughs> and we have these perfectly sized bookshelves right there. This is what this is this is where you're going to read if you're if you're a kid. This is these are the books you're pulling off the shelves. It should be right at your eye level. It should be easy to do you shouldn't have to reach for it right and every shelf is a different size so you fit different sized kids books some are big some are small um, and they're curved everything has a curve to our fixtures they all have movement and for the kids section it's very important to have movement and for them to have a, a everything at their fingertips but also to be unique and fun but classy because kids are classy. They want to be classy. And the things you'll find in that section are, you know, obviously everybody has bone and amulet and some of the wonderful graphic novel series. But we also have things that are a little bit more obscure. We curate like we do everything else in our store. We curate for the kids and they give us input. Our manager, Harley, is just wonderful with children and, and she talks to them. And they give her recommendations and she'll put things in the orders that we're placing. And I'll say, well, what is this? And she said, oh, well, you know, little Katie, she, she recommended it to me. She said, I should read it. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, okay, let's get it. And before you know it, Katie has made us a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and then looking down over on this, was our, our, our young customers are under the watchful eye of Yoda and Kermit the Frog. Yeah. That beautiful piece by Peter... Peter DeSev. Peter DeSev. Pixar artist, right? That's right. Of uh, Kermit the Frog and, and Yoda fishing in the swamp. <laughs> That's right. And I remember us, the summer before we opened the store, just walking down an aisle at Comic-Con and seeing that piece and the both would just stop it. That's it. That's the piece we need. Kid section. Let's get it now. Yeah. We didn't even, we didn't even have the store yet. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't have all the money yet. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's how much <laughs> but it's it was called easy being green it's yeah. not how do we not get that yeah. yeah and that was you know really one of the best purchases we ever made because people walk by and see it through the window and kids come in and point at it and um it's a piece of nostalgia that speaks to not just the kids but the kid inside of all of the adults so, you know, if you ever want to come by the shop, you should bring your kids. Never be afraid to bring your children. We welcome them. And we like dogs, too.
Retails, the breakup. Listen, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I really think it's best if I move on. It's been really great. I've loved every minute of the time we've spent together, but I just need a change. It's nothing personal. I just want to see what else is out there. Yes, it's the dreaded breakup. But this is no husband taking leave of his wife after many years of marriage. This is no girlfriend trying to let her heartbroken bow down easy. This is a relationship far more personal. A relationship rarely discussed out in the public arena. This is the dreaded split between a valued subscriber and their faithful comic book retailer. Folks, it's about time we opened the curtains came out of the closet and hashed this one out. Whether pulling weekly books and keeping personal files, offering discounts on orders through previews, catalogs, or just keeping track of individual customers and tailoring their product to suit their needs, most comic book stores offer some sort of subscriber program for their regular customers. We've always had subscriber programs in some shape or form, always had some sort of incentive or personal service that requires micro-attention to each individual shopper. It's part of the foundation we've built as a customer service-based store that always acts not on the motto, the customer is always right, but the customer is most important. Any store with these kinds of programs and policies is undoubtedly going to build a strong, personal, and yes, intimate relationship with their regulars. As with any relationship, it starts out giddy and exciting. Over time, it grows deeper and richer as you get to know the intricate details of one another's ideals and personal histories. Then it either settles into a comfortable rhythm of mutual respect and admiration, or it heads in another direction entirely, with one discovering they moved in with the wrong person and has to figure out some way to get the hell out. Let me clear the air right out of the gate and represent for my fellow retailers. We know you're not monogamous. We know you shop around. We know you spend time with other comic book guys. It's okay if you leave us. It's okay if you choose to shop somewhere else. It's okay if you close your subscription account. After many years of standing behind counters and reading customer expressions, I can see a potential breakup as soon as it walks through my door. Maybe it has something to do with the inability to meet my gaze. Maybe it's the sweat beads on their forehead even though the weather is altogether pleasant. Maybe it's the mumbled salutation instead of the usual enthusiasm that comes from walking into the haven of a comic book shop. I always know when something's up. It's all just a matter of how it's going to play out, what line they're going to give me, what tactic they're going to take. I've had my heart crushed, my love go unrequited, my devotion betrayed, and my confidence shattered by any number of women in my life. But I've never seen more nervous tension and fear in the face of my partner than when they come in to close their subscription account. I gaze into their eyes and see sleepless nights, tossing and turning, trying to figure out how they're going to break it off, how they can look into the eyes of their greatest friend and confidant and tell them they're leaving. Now, I've heard stories of crazy retailers who have refused to let someone off the hook, who have gone out of their way to show their disdain and hurt at being jilted. I've even heard of a retailer who staunchly refused to close the customer's account and called their home incessantly, tearfully asking, what did I do? But short of the extremely rare instance of a nutty shop owner stalking you for closing your account, it's important that you know this. Your friendly neighborhood comic book gal loves and respects you whether you have an account with them or not. In fact, boy, I hate to say this in an open forum, It's a hell of a lot easier on us when you just come in to shop. We show you what's on the shelves, and you decide what to buy. Spending infinite hours setting aside everything you ask for on a weekly basis and desperately hoping you buy it all when you get the time to stop in causes all sorts of nervous anxiety. 
Please don't get me wrong. I seriously love my customers. I consider them family. But like my family, if one of them wants to move out of the house to explore the world or decides they need a change, they get my blessings and good wishes. They know our home will always be there and their room just as they left it should they ever want to come back. If I discover my wife is running around, spending time with other men and seeing what they can offer her that I can't, the earth is most assuredly going to shake. But if I discover that my faithful subscriber has been spending time rifling their fingers through someone else's back issue bins, all I'm going to do is be glad for them that they completed that run of X-Men they'd been trying to finish for the last decade. Seven days a week at the comic book store are made up of funny little mini betrayals. Funny because the customer thinks they've betrayed me. Me. Hey, I found that issue of Captain America you needed. Customer. Oh, um, that's cool. I got it already. Our eyes meet. There's a brief moment of unspoken heartache between us. They realize what they've just revealed. I stand frozen, unsure how to respond. They desperately jump in. Well, yeah, um, I just happened to be on the other side of town, and they were open late, and I thought I'd just stop in. And they happen to have a copy at cover price, and I figured you shouldn't have to go through the trouble to find it for me, and I just bought it and left. You know I don't ever shop there, right? You know this is the only store for me, right? Right? Frankly, the only thing that matters to me is that you're happy and that you got what you wanted for your collection. I'm not your husband or your boyfriend. I'm not your girlfriend or your wife. I'm your comic book retailer. There needn't be any secrets or standing on ceremony or any need to impress. I accept you for who you are and make no judgments on your actions. If your employment situation has changed and money's tight, don't keep your subscription open because you're afraid to disappoint me. Hell, don't keep it open because you might disappoint yourself either. Just cut back and ride it out. If you're moving out of town, please don't make me last in the communication loop. Give me a little time to plan so I don't get stuck with a month's worth of comics. I actually had a longtime subscriber not show up for six weeks, and when I finally tracked him down, he told me he was living across the country in Chicago and that he'd forgotten to let me know. Weekly comic book junkies don't forget they need their fix. They just get nervous when changing dealers. If you're closing your account because you're unhappy with my store, my service, my product line, or my employees, please give me a chance to hear your concerns and see if I can address them. You being proactive with your concerns makes my store better and tailors it more to your needs. Look, we all have life changes. We all navigate through difficult emotional, financial, and medical turmoil on occasion. We all have to adapt and adjust accordingly. Whatever you're going through, your comic book retailer has either been through it, is going through it right now, or will experience it any day now. Remember that we're human. We don't take it personally. And we're retailers because we want to serve your needs, not complicate them. Cut back on your titles. Close your subscription account. Shop another store if you really feel it's a better fit for you. Just don't be afraid to communicate with me about it. And don't be afraid to be honest. And whatever you do, just don't break up with me on my voicemail. The Blast Off Podcast is produced by The Colonel, Jeff Fox, Scott Tipton, and me. Original music is composed and performed by Derek Anthony Gray. You can find more of his musical compositions on his website, DerekAnthonyGray.com. For more information about anything you've heard us talk about today, check us out online at BlastOffComics.com. We have an active Facebook presence, so check us out over there on Facebook. And you can reach us on Twitter, at BlastOffComics, or on Instagram. Or you can come by our retail location in North Hollywood in the heart of the Arts District, 5118. Lancashire Boulevard in North Hollywood, just two blocks south of Magnolia. See you soon.